Hi, guys, and welcome. This is Jen Gata Siciliano, artist, memoir writer, bipolar psychiatric survivor, and your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast, the place that offers an alternative perspective on mental illness, highlighting creativity, non-conventional healing, and breaking on through to the other side. If you are ready for a new narrative on the mental realm that celebrates crazy and cool without penalty, then Not As Crazy As You Think is for you. Hello, this is Jen Gata Siciliano, your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast. Today, I'd like to introduce a special guest that we have with us. His name is Alan Lutwin, and he's president of Westchester Collaborative Theater in Austin, New York, which is a theater company dedicated to nurturing new work for the stage. All member playwrights, actors, and directors participate in the lab process, where several times a month new plays are read and critiqued. But it's much more than that. So we're going to get into what this place is and how it's how it began and how it's developed. So, Alan, thank you so much for coming on board. Thanks, Jan. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Well, we have had a bit of a history, and I feel like it's almost like decades now, right? <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. it's weird how time goes by. But we, I'm sure we've discussed this, but for our audience and, you know, for the clarity of, of what it takes to make this kind of thing happen, how did you even get into theater? I know that you were a playwright and are a playwright. And how did you stumble into the work of the stage? Well, I um, grew up in New York City, which is, of course, theater capital of the country, if not the world. And I've always been interested in playwriting, um, did some work, never wrote professionally, but um, but I had an interest in writing since I was very young. And um, in the city, you had the advantage of having the ability to attend a lot of black box theater spaces, a lot of workshop areas, and meeting people who have the same goals that you do, actors, writers, directors, and getting training. And it was really a, a wonderful place to be a young person in theater because there were so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the course of uh, my play development, I was able to get uh, work done in the city. I was able to get work published. I was able to get work produced, not only in the New York City area, but throughout North America and Europe. And uh, I wouldn't say I had a thriving playwright career, but it was certainly an avocation that I enjoyed and uh, I enjoyed, like I said, the opportunity to have so many choices um, to, um, you know, have my work done and developed. But my background, I mean, professionally, I was a school teacher. That's how I started initially, um, taught uh, in a junior high school in the Bronx for a number of years and um, segued from that into working as a writer and a producer on public television and cable TV. So I had the opportunity to actually uh, get worked on other mediums as well as theater, and then um, worked in industrial videos also as a writer and producer and director. And my most recent career uh, had been working as a former training manager, uh, which is, I know, a, a bit of a stretch from being a playwright, but <laughs> it, it, it did pay the bills, helped me put my daughter through college and kept me solvent all these years. And um, like many people, you know, my family made the move up from the city to the suburbs at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for another home for my work and my uh, desire to continue to grow as a playwright at that point. You know, it's amazing. I didn't know all the, that about <laughs> like all those areas of uh, where the, that you've hit, you know, professionally and artistically. I think that's incredible. I mean, but it speaks to what you do now. When did your, uh, a vision for WCT come into being? And then like, when did it start moving into manifesting itself into form? Because there were a lot of beginning stages of this before you found like a permanent home. So like, explain like how that happened. When we did finally move up to Westchester and I was looking for a home, I found that there were few, if any, uh, opportunities for getting new plays worked on. And, um, I miss that. You know, I missed the camaraderie. I missed the closeness uh, of venues and people. And I looked around and there was actually a local theater company that was doing the kind of work that I wanted to be involved in. And I joined that company. And after a couple of years, I became the moderator of the workshops, uh, bi-weekly workshops, and uh, really started enjoying that. 
Uh, what, and then that company folded mm-hmm. uh, after a while. And I had a, uh, you know, still a desire to perpetuate this kind of work, not only for myself, but for others. Mm-hmm. And had met a core group of people um, in the area, you know, and the area that I'm talking about, by the way, is Ossining, New York, which I'm assuming there are people who don't live in the area who are listening to this. So Ossining, I just expl- will explain, is a village on the Hudson River uh, of Ossining, kind of midway, mid-county. It's about 40 miles from Midtown. And uh, it's a suburban community. A lot of people who live in this village uh, work in the city have connections there, but it's also um, becoming a, a vibrant um, little village of its own and, and the artistic components of it are, are growing every year. Anyway, um, so when this other company folded, there were still a group of us who wanted to perpetuate what we had been doing. And I took the initiative and, and tried to find some kind of a home or a beginning with no budget, you know, no plan of action. It was just trying to to start something from scratch, basically. Yeah. And I went to our local public library in the village of Ossining, and they had a theater, they still do have a theater, and I asked them, would you be willing to host us and these workshops on a regular basis? And first they said, no, you know, we, we have such a crying need for this theater space, we can't dedicate it to one organization uh, more than two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. And I made my case. I said, look, you know, we need a home to get this up and running. So if you could see your way clear to giving us at least two, three nights a month to have a space to do our workshops, it would be really appreciated. And uh, I made the case and they accepted it. So that was the beginning. Uh, We now had a home. It wasn't our space, but it was a home for workshops and labs. Um, And we began attracting people. And this is 14 years ago. Uh, Because we've been been in business for 14 years. Uh, This is how the company um, got started. And to this day, even though we've grown so much since then, these workshops, we call them labs, are still the core of the company. It's what we do. Uh, We were a new play development company that incubates new work and that draws actors, writers, and directors together to combine resources and combine art skills to bring plays to fruition. So that that was the beginning. So before you get more into like how it ended up getting into like the building right now that you have, I'd like to just like zoom in on what you're mentioning, because it is important um, in terms of like how plays are developed. And I don't know if everybody knows how plays. I think a lot of people just like imagine like, you know, the playwright writing it and then, you know, uh, finding a space and then putting it up. And it's like not a problem. Like part of what I loved about developing plays is that you get a lot of traction by how the interaction of the um, the process, as you call it, the lab process, the workshop process, how it kind of informs the playwright, what need, changes need to be made or what isn't clear and, you know, how the actors like sit with this experience and, and how it unfolds, you take it from like nuts to bolts to, you know, and then that's how it gets to the to the finish right. line. So can you describe it a little bit for those of sure. people who don't know? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, theater has been a dying art form for the past 2000 years, mm-hmm. uh, ever since the Greeks put on shows. People have been saying <laughs> theater, theater's not going to last. And it's a struggle. I mean, this is not the kind of work you want to do if you, you know, want to make a whole lot of money, um, if you if you want to have a lot of security, because nonprofits in our culture don't get the kind of support and recognition they need. That's just a fact. I mean, there are so many struggling uh, theater companies throughout the country that have gone belly up, uh, especially mm-hmm. since COVID. And it's it's hard. It's, it's a hard area to work in. Mm-hmm. That being said, it, when you take on new work, you're doubling your problems because <laughs> it's much easier to have an audience come and see, you know, the umpteenth revival of uh, cabaret or uh, how to succeed in business, you know, you name it, streetcar, right. whatever, because they know it and you have a built in uh, PR uh in a sense about what 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 they're going to see, for for an audience to come in and see a new play means they have to trust this theater company, this group of artists, to put on quality work, mm-hmm. and that is really a challenge. And I can talk more about that later. But forging the link between not only uh, 
artists, but between the artist and the audience and the community is essential. Mm -hmm. So any kind of success you have as a new play development company. But what we do in these labs, Jen, is it's the first time the work has usually been seen mm -hmm. by anybody other than the playwright. And it's nail biting time for them. They are reluctant to let it go. They are frightened of what people might say about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of anxiety built into uh, the workshop process because it's not just reading the play, but it's having it critiqued and getting feedback from your fellow members. And we try to be constructive and we try to cast the play uh, specifically, you know, and and have uh, the actors come in who would do the play justice. But act, but the writer has to sit through not only the reading of the play, but also the feedback session. Unlike other art forms like, you know, uh, prose, poetry, ballet, um, art, fine arts, whatever, theater is a public medium and you need an audience to know what you have. Right. So you can't judge. And I've been doing this for so many years now, and I'm still astonished at how many times I read a play and then I see it read. And it's like a different thing, totally. Mm -hmm. um, there's an amalgam of of the what the actor brings to it, the voice of the actors, and and the script that is just different. And so you need you need actors, you need, and of course, a director and a company to put on a show. But even in a workshop environment, um, the reading of the script is essential to knowing what you have. And and it's also important, I think, to establish um, an environment of support in this community of ours. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, writers are very tentative about having their work read, very uh, kind of apprehensive about the response. And it is very easy. And I know this from my background because I remember some of the workshops I attended in the city and sitting there and having the instructor tear it to shreds, oh you know, tear, tearing the work to shreds or having you know fellow playwrights not really be supportive. And it's devastating. There's tremendous damage that is done to people when they don't get the support and the feedback that they need. And so we have cultivated in our company um, a sensibility where, you know, you, you say things that are constructive, they don't have to be that you love the play, but things that are helpful to the writer. If you only have harsh things to say, if you hated the work, best not to say anything yeah. because it's not going to help writers shut down. You know, you stop being able to process things when you get too much thrown at you. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And I've had, you know, a number of playwrights burst into tears and become really upset at the end mm -hmm. of, a, of a workshop when they feel that they've been, um, you know, dumped on. And so yeah. people who have that kind of mindset, um, who really like to be the kind of harsh um, spirit don't usually last in our company because we nurture new work. We don't destroy it. And wow. I think that's really important for people to know, you know, how critical it is to come with that kind of a mentality when you join a workshop process like ours. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the main things I find to, it's easy to shut down. It's easy to stop new work. It's hard right. to keep it going. And it is hard to also, you know, be a responsible, you know, uh, member or even just a theater member who's w witnessing like a reading. And sometimes you open it up to um, the talk from the audience and it's, you know, I feel you have to have something of a responsibility to the artist to, you know, have that that baseline of respect that they're even getting up there and doing this and, you know, seeing if you can offer a little bit. But I find that, you know, you're also one of the I mean, you're always pretty much the main person introducing these things. And you're really good at creating that spirit of of respect in the environment that uh, it where it's needed. So, you know, that's, that's a, Thank that's you. something. Yeah. I mean, positive to you because it, it feels like you just know how to steer that, you know? And I think that's really where a lot of people feel safe in this environment, you know, that you've created. Um, well, thank you for explaining that because it, you know, it, it, it is very interesting because it, it, and it goes through several reading processes, right? It's not just one necessarily. Right. So uh, after, you know, the process usually is the play comes in or it doesn't even have to be the whole play. It can be scenes from a play. It can be work in progress or whatever. And um, we get it cast and read. And then after the feedback, the writer is welcome to take it back and do rewrites on it and bring mm -hmm. it back to the workshop as many times as he or she wants to. Um, 
for additional readings until they feel you know it's it's good to go. And then part of our structure in WCT, we have uh, re- stage readings and c- kind of tier two levels of production where we'll have a weekend where we'll put on you know a series of one acts or a full length in front of an invited audience. We'll have it cast. We'll have a director assigned to it, a dramaturg. That's another part of our process is to dramaturg these plays and to get the audience in. And um, we call the name of the program is now called Play in the Box. The theater is the box. And so we do this several times a year. And then the third phase is a full-blown main stage where we put all of the resources, set design, costume, wardrobe, um, uh, you know, everything behind these productions. And those are usually two-week runs, mm-hmm. uh, two, two weekend runs. And uh, that's the third phase. And then after that, play is welcome to go out into the world. And I'm very proud to say that over the course of 14 years, we've had numerous plays that are produced not only in our region, but throughout the country that have taken on a life of their own. So when I talk about WCT as an incubator, you know, we, we do that. We hatch new works and then they take off and they go into the world and we just look with pride at any future productions these plays have. And very often, by the way, the actors... You know, some people say that it's a writing company which is focused on writers, but that's really not true because actors are critical to this new play development process. Yes. They come in in the beginning, right? They're there at the first reading, and many of them are attached to the play and then grow with the play as it becomes performed. But also, they inform the playwright's development of the character, their interpretation of of their character very frequently helps the writer uh, edit the work and transform the work. And so it really is a collaborative uh, process between actor, writer, and then of course, when the director comes in. And and I have to say the name of our company, Westchester Collaborative Theater, it's a mouthful. And <laughs> when, when the company was founded 14 years ago, I don't know that I thought all that much about what the name should be. I thought, well, we're in Westchester. We want to be collaborative. We're theater. Let's call it Westchester or WCT. Had I only known what the company would grow to become, I probably would have looked for a more uh, easy to pronounce um, name. But collaboration is our middle name. I joke about that. And it really requires everybody working together um, to launch these plays. And it's a community of people. And uh, it's really heartwarming to see, you know, we are our community of Austin within the county of Westchester is incredibly diverse, um, culturally, racially, ethnically. Um, it's one of the most diverse communities in the area. And our our company reflects that. Mm-hmm. And we are known for that. Uh, you know, we have ages from teenager to people in their 80s and 90s, actually, writing work and acting with us. We have all colors, all ethnic groups, racial groups. And we we foster that and we encourage that within the company. And that's given us, you know, a, a, such a, a vibrant voice uh, yeah. because we have such a diverse group of people who join with what we do and who present their work and who offer their talents to uh, to the community. So that's been something that's been kind of a, um, you know, essential to our growth and development over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I do love the fact that you have collaborative in there because it really kind of signals that this is a, a working space. You know, it's not just like, okay, this is our performance space. You know, like it's right. it's about the process. And so many, you know, places don't really dedicate themselves to that. And it's true. It's particularly, it's, it's interesting to me that, you know, in a place like Westchester, which is, one, again, for those who aren't that familiar, it's only the county above uh, New York City area. It's like you would think that there'd be so many spaces that are working on this, like, you know, in the off, off-Broadway off scene, right? But it's just not that common. It seems like you really do have to go into the city for this kind of work to be done. And right. it's such a refreshing thing to know that it can be brought anywhere. It's so important to remember that it doesn't only have to exist in New York City. You know, this process can be done anywhere. So, yeah, you've done an amazing job developing it. I mentioned how challenging it is to do a startup like this, new play yes. developments, right? But one of the things that we were um, kind of convinced we needed to do was to do outreach to our community. Like we didn't want to be a standalone 
artistic organization and keep our doors shut, except we'll be doing performances. We wanted to work with other businesses and components of our community to grow together. You know, Assining as a community has had challenges in the past. Um, there has there hadn't been a vibrant theater community um, and there hadn't been a lot of outreach done. So one of the things that we've done from day one is to go out and talk to other business owners, restaurant owners, uh, people who had bars, whatever, who, who had the same kind of interest in drawing a community of people in, into Ossining and try to partner with them. And we were you know, successful in that. Um, mm-hmm. trying to get people to come downtown to explore the area and uh, whether they take out an ad in our program or we promote them through, you know, 10% off if you see the show and then go to have dinner here or whatever, uh, just working together. It's been really important and I think helps see in, in reflection how the community itself has grown and brought uh, people into the into Ossining for an evening or an, an afternoon of not only theater, but also for, you know, um, eating at a restaurant or drinking in a bar or whatever. So that's been one of the things that we wanted to um, firm up and and go after. Another thing was to do outreach to our school district. Mm. So that, you know, we have partnerships now with the high school. And we've had that for years to bring in students, not only as actors and playwrights actually, but as tech people. And there've been instances over the past few years where someone's come in as a newbie high school student and, has learned technical stuff, lighting and sound from us, and then gone on to a college career and actually professions in theater uh, technology because of their experience with us. And that makes us feel really proud. And uh, again, it broadens our roots into the community. It lets people know that we're not just a standalone organization, but we really have an interest in uh, bringing people on board and working with other groups of people, theaters, businesses. Another initiative that we've had from almost the beginning was to take our productions to senior homes mm. throughout our area. So many seniors are unable to get out and enjoy theater. They have uh, ambulatory limitations. And we bring, we brought theater to these senior communities for years now. And we're, you know, we love doing that. We love the response we get from the residents. Um, they, they're so appreciative. And, um, and, and they do talk back with our writers and actors as well, just like an audience in the theater would do. So all of these things, you know, have been going on for years and it's an ongoing process for us. Um, And I had mentioned to you before about growing the company, you know, trying to measure the growth so that we don't, our ambitions don't exceed our ability to encompass what we want to uh, encompass. Mm -hmm. And that's been another thing we've had to kind of work on. Um, So anyway, at this point, we we are known as a ethnically, racially, um, age diverse theater company, which makes me feel very proud. And mm-hmm. it's something unique. Again, you know, 40 miles south of us, there's a hundred, hundreds of these organizations, but not, not in this suburb. And right. I think people could look, you know, whether you live in outside of Pittsburgh or Philly or Chicago, LA, I don't care where you live. If you live in a suburban area outside of these metropolitan centers, you're going to find probably something very similar to that. Yes. You're going to find, you know, I wouldn't say a cultural desert, but I think a dearth of theater companies, which help new writers and actors and directors kind of work together. So I think, you know, the lessons that we've learned, I think can be applied elsewhere. Um, For the first six years or so of WCT, we were doing all of our shows in the library theater. There was a um, arts organization that we partnered with called the Arts Council in Ossining, and they had rented a space at the firehouse in the village. Uh, They had an art gallery there, and they invited us to bring our shows in and to do workshops there. So that was kind of a second home for us. But it became clear it was, you know, not the best situation to have to schlep everything, um, cables and lights and everything. Wherever we did a show, it was like moving around. And we had this vagabond company <laughs> moving from here to there. And it was hard. So we, we made a strong effort to find a home. And it's never easy mm-hmm. when you're a 501c3 nonprofit with limited resources to afford anything. But after looking diligently for, I guess, over well over a year, we did find a space. Um, this was about eight years ago. And it, the vision was it could become a black box. So black boxes, again, are something that are part and parcel of the arts in many urban centers. But suburban communities, rural communities don't 
particularly know what they are or have many of them. So we're mm-hmm. always explaining, this is what a black box is. It's a intimate theater. Everything's painted black and then nothing is set. The stage is movable, seats are movable. You can make, transform it. And, and you know, we'll talk about other things that we do there, but you know, we do music and other things as well. And we can transform it from theater to music and back again to whatever is going on very quickly. That's the concept of black box. So the vision was the space that we saw what had been an abandoned cabinet making factory. Hmm. It, it hadn't been used for probably decades. It was sitting there idly. It was in awful, awful shape. I mean, floors were broken into cracks in the floor walls. Uh, there was a hole in the ceiling. It was really in bad shape. And of course we couldn't afford to bring in heavy duty contractors. So we did it all ourselves. Wow. The members, members of the company did most of the um, renovation painting. We brought in a a contractor uh, to do, you know, the last minute stuff of putting up walls and stuff, drywalling. But uh, we converted it pretty much from this abandoned hovel into a usable black box theater space that sits 50 people in an intimate space. And um, it has brick walls, as you know, it has high ceilings. It has this very industrial techie look. And, um, Coincidentally, by the way, the ambience there is incredible for Mm. sound. Um, The the acoustics are amazing for music. Uh, Artists who perform at the theater rave about it. They want to record there. We had no idea it was going to be as good as it is. But uh, I think the industrial heritage of the space feeds into that. So so we moved in eight years ago. And the location is in the riverfront section of Ossining. Uh, adjacent to you know the train station that takes people into and out of the city, and it's a struggling area. It's kind of a you know it's it's it hasn't been a high priority uh, for development, um, and it's just beginning. You know, there's some work going on which I think is going to be leading to gentrification very soon. So it's kind of exciting to be in at the beginning of that, but mm-hmm. it's still kind of funky and industrial looking, and and kind of you know like. I'm old enough to remember what Soho was like in the city before it was Soho. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of that vibe, you know, of kind of something industrial, but yet artsy. Yeah. And so we have this, you know, 50 seat black box space um, uh, with a spacious dressing room area and a little bar. And um, and it's kind of a cool spot. It's uh, a little bit challenging to find if you haven't been there. You know, our signage isn't the greatest, but, but people do find us and, uh, you know, come back to enjoy what we do, so. Yeah, I think it's incredible because I remember when it first came to be, I said, oh my gosh, like, I wish this was like a thing, you know, that was more common. And then it's like, forget about, I wish, this is here now. And it's here to to celebrate the arts in so many different ways. You have opened this space up, as you say, to house other types of entertainment, and I know people like I was there just last night. Uh, had an ama- you had an amazing trio. You're opening it up to now to jazz musicians, and they seem to love the space. As you say, it's such great. It's so great acoustically. How do you get all of these musicians who are like top notch? I mean, really high level performers. How did you reach out to to get them into your space? So what's really interesting, you know, 14 years is a long time in in the art world, I guess, to be around. And you build a reputation and, you know, you begin to um, hear about things. So from a theater perspective, uh, the growth has been astonishing the past year or two. And it's not like we're reaching out to people. It's people have heard about us. We have transplants from New York City, people who've artists have moved up to this area, the you know, Northern Westchester area mm-hmm. who've heard about the company and want to join us. Incredibly talented and gifted people that have added immeasurably to the company. By the same token, musicians, you know, like the guy last night, um, Gary Smolian, is a um, baritone sax player and mm. world-class, you know, multiple Emmy, uh, Grammy-winning player. And he is incredible. Just a sensational, a sa- sensational musician. He had played at the theater a couple of years ago with with a piano player and i saw i met him then and you know we just exchanged information and i thought of him again when we had an opening so it was that kind of outreach where we just kind of fall we fall in together somehow yeah there's some kind of collaboration it could be these guys play with a band or something and uh we just exchanged information and then 
I thought of get, inviting Gary back, but um, but yeah. So this this is the other thing that's happened uh, once we found a home, because you can't do a play every weekend, right? It, it's so labor intensive between right. the pre-production and the rehearsing and everything. So they're dark weekends. And I thought, you know, and I love jazz and I love, you know, music. And I thought, why not give people an opportunity to see other art forms and make it, make it more than just a theater, but make it into like a mini performing arts center. Yeah. where You can come and enjoy other types of things when you're not enjoying theater. And so there was, a, it was a curated music series and, um, it's been very successful because there are people, you know, much to my chagrin who aren't interested in theater, but do like music. That's yeah. great. That's fine. Yeah. So we offer a different audience, something to come in and, and enjoy. And uh, for the most part, we started out all jazz like four or five years ago, and then we kind of branched out. So we do everything now. It's more, you know, not as genre specific as it had been. We do, you know, folk, bluegrass, American standards. Um, and Austin, New York has also been the home to some incredibly talented musicians, uh, world-class musicians who travel the world and, you know, come back to Assening occasionally. And we've tried to bring them to the theater because, yeah. you know, there were homes for theater and music in so many surrounding communities. Like there was a, a golden triangle surrounding our village of Ossining for years where mm-hmm. people could come to perform. Ossining didn't have a space and to have a home right here in our village where they can, we can do music and theater and other things is great because it gives us a chance to expose our audiences to some homegrown talent. Um, and we tell them all the time, look, you don't have to go to the this, this city to enjoy world-class talent, whether it's music or theater. We have these artists right here. You can drive five, 10 minutes, park your car for free, grab a bite to eat and see the same caliber of talent that you would uh, in the city, but only spend a lot more time yeah. and money doing it. So, so that's kind of one of the things that we're, we're trying to promote. Um, so the, anyway, the music has been really, really fun. We also uh, about a year ago started a stand up comedy night. Okay. So yes, this is interesting. And I see this is a new development. So tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. Well, people were talking like, why don't you guys do stand up here? It seemed like a great, you know, intimate environment for for comedy work and we try to give it you know give it a go and we brought in new york city based comedians um about a year ago i think we started the first one and we're building up an audience for that as well so um again it's another way of giving our community different options for entertainment uh yes. people like comedy music theater we do try and cross pollinate all of those to get people to try us out uh, with something other than what they might be originally come here for. But uh, it's exciting and it's fun, and we'll continue to do that. And we, we also do classes at the theater now. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that, and how do people get involved with it? Do you need a background? Is it all available online that you could sign up? How does that work? Yeah, well, the classes uh, are taught. Some of the people who teach them are members, professional um, acting instructors, scene study instructors. We have an acting for camera class. We even have a yoga class this semester. Mm. Um, and you will, we'll talk about our website, I'm assuming at some point. So that's how people will mm-hmm. find out about these things. But yeah, no, we welcome you know anyone who lives in the area to uh, find out about classes and performances and and um, come, come visit us. Uh, the classes are really good. Again, they're similar to what you might find in the city. Uh, a fraction of the of the cost usually, and uh, much more convenient to get to. Mm-hmm. And um, we we have both our members and we have the general public coming on board to sign up for them. So those are ongoing. We have semesters now, so we'll have a spring and a fall semester where we um, have a variety of classes that we offer. So there's a lot going on. It's a it's a busy little space. <laughs> it's vibrant. It's growing, and I'm so excited about it because. Of course, you know, I always saw it as the theater space, right? Yeah. But now having gone to a few of these jazz nights um, and knowing how this is like burgeoning into other areas, it is all about the arts and the kind of the performative aspect of it, you know, like how can that person on the other side have an audience and then work together? Because you can't, all of these types of arts that you're bringing in, you need an audience. <laughs> so right. they can't live on its own, you know, and it's great that you're breathing life 
into so many areas, I think that, and, and what I'm uh, assuming too, is that it probably helps to not have a dark space, right? If you're going to be worried about, you know, paying, paying for the space. <laughs> so this is very helpful, I'm sure, financially to, yes. to what you do. Yeah. I understand that now next weekend you are aiming for this big fall fundraiser. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what people can do for, you know, if they're interested in, in getting tickets for that and supporting this? Yeah. Well, there's a uh, space um, right opposite our local village train station called, it's called Harbor Square. It's a development community. And um, we're going to be um, having our fundraiser in their social room, which is on the eighth floor, gorgeous views of the river. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're going to have some great food, drink. We'll have entertainment. Uh, a lot of our members are performing either little skits or we have uh, one of our members is an outstanding vocalist and musician, and he'll be performing for us. Um, we also have you know, a, a live auction items. We're auctioning off a, a autographed Taylor Swift guitar mm -hmm. for any Swift, any Swifty groupies out there. Uh, which is kind of unique. And another thing that we're auctioning off, which I think is of interest, is a villa in Anguilla for a week. So um, those are two of the uh, key items. But uh, yeah, we do this every year. And uh, a lot of our supporters come, a lot of members come, and it's it's a lot of fun. So that, again, can be um, looked at more on our website. And of course, you can buy tickets. We also have a 50-50 raffle. And um other things to look at there. So looking forward to that as well next Saturday. Those fundraisers seem to do well. And they're beautiful. Yeah. I've been to I've been to one myself. Um, you know, I want to talk about like just generally uh, like a little bits and pieces of of what works at best in a space like that. So I know that you dedicated over the years to the short play format or the 10 minute. Do you think that that is just like one of these ways for people to like generate a lot of pieces, short pieces, and, you know, kind of get them up and running quickly without like a hard, you know, main stage, you know, budget or anything like this? It seems to be the thing that it, it always draws people in and it's really fun to watch. Like you, you've you never given up on that, the, like the 10 minute format. Right. Yeah, no, that's true, Jen. We... um I think one of the reasons why we do it a lot, well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is it's easier for writers to write a 10-minute play than a full-length play. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the difference between a short story and a, and a novel. You know, it's just long form is always more challenging. Yeah. And people can uh, master the form of a 10-minute play a lot easier. So it, that's one reason. Also, um, it gives us a chance. We, we have grown so much. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but we have like 150 members now in the tri-state area. And a lot of 50 some odd playwrights. So we like to give our writers a chance to get their work seen. We have mm -hmm. over 80 actors in the company. We want to give them a chance to perform. And short form plays like this are a chance to uh, to get a lot of people work. You know, we, we cram like 16, 20 people into our backstage area for, <laughs> for a show, actors. Um, and we just completed a Halloween show where we did um, six uh, 10 minute plays. So Yeah, how'd that go? It was great. It was the first time we'd done that. And for those of you who, who don't live in the area, we are in the Mid-Hudson Valley region, kind of close to Sleepy Hollow, where the tradition of Halloween first started in this country. Mm -hmm. So there's a tremendous uh, interest in Halloween, especially in this geographical area. And we, we wanted to see if we could become uh, a part of that. Yeah. And so this is our first foray into that. We also work with the uh, the Village of Ossetting in an outdoor um, Halloween festival. They had a tour of the local Greenway uh, two weeks ago, and we had some of our writers write short monologues and our actors perform them. It's kind huh. of a spook a spook fest, and that was another initiative that we did, and and it worked it worked really well. So we're very happy. It's kind of a lot to take on, but but it, it worked it worked well for us. Um, and then another thing, you know, short plays. You, you come for anything with short plays and look, they're not all going to be, you know, terrific works, but the good thing is if you sit through something and you don't really like it, all right, in 10 minutes, there'll be something else that you might like a lot more. Right. So it's a lot easier, I think, to sit through something short that you don't like than to have a full length play that you're not connecting with for an evening. And right, uh, right. It, it helps the audience get through that. Um, and I, I do want to say another word about audiences, you mm -hmm. know, because I talked about the community, but, 
the audiences are are essential. And if there's anybody who's listening to this who has any aspirations of starting up a theater company, mm. whether it's new play or not, I got to tell you, the relationship with the audience is the single most critical element to having something like a new theater succeed. And if you're doing new plays, you need to have that element of trust because when the audiences come to our theater to see something, it's new, never been seen before. They don't know what they're going to be experiencing. Right. It could be a wonderful evening of theater or something not so great. And so they have to trust us. And that, after all these years, continues to astonish me. <laughs> because I don't know how I would feel about you know spending money to see something that I have no idea what it is or who's in it or whatever. But our audiences do that. You know, they come on a regular basis, buy tickets to see something brand new that may be good or may not be as good as they would like it to be. But but they trust us to do it and they're there to support us. And the kind of company that we are, because we're community-based, we do rely on donations from our community of theater goers and supporters as well. We could not survive without their not only their attendance, but their financial support. Because as lovely as theater and music are, as art forms in a space as as intimate as ours, it's really hard to uh, make a lot of money doing what we do. Right. And frequently we don't make money. Frequently it's a wash or maybe sometimes you even lose money. So the donation element of this from private individuals, the government grants that we get are essential to the survival of, of our company. And I think people understand that and they know that and they, they appreciate what we do. They appreciate the effort uh, put into it and they want to see it uh, thrive and, and continue in the community. I think it speaks a lot to who, again, I've said it in the beginning, but I want to say it again. I say this to you all the time whenever I go across <laughs> you, but I think it says a lot to who you are because people do try to start these things and they don't, they can't maintain it. And I think that, you know, you are so good at reaching out to community. You are so good at giving people a voice and with respect and with this sense of, you know, you provide a place where trust can grow. So I do, you know, I see that um, trust is a big element here because it's true. It's like, you know, and I've brought many people over the years to to come and, and see these plays and with the same kind of thing in my mind knowing that it may be good it may be so so you know it's always a risk whenever you're dealing with something so brand new like that but also i think the audience feels that they're part of that they're part of you know this experience it's this big experiment you know <laughs> that we're right. all going into together but there's something about the intimacy of this and, and the way you kind of speak to your audience and the the audience keeps coming back. I mean, last night even, it was an example of like most people had been there before. There weren't that many new right. newcomers. And it seems to be the case that you have this loyal base, but people continue to sprinkle in and find you. So yeah. there is enough talk in the, the community and and you know, even, even outside of that. So I think it's, it's, it's exciting. And, you know, listen, I, I'm, I, I appreciate you kind of speaking to the reality of it because it's not about making like the big bucks, right? It's almost about this, like committing, making the commitment to the artistic voice in society, because without places like this, it, I, you know, I'm used to it now. Like, I, I know that it exists. I always try to, like, try to find a way to get myself there at some point during the season. So I do appreciate it. And I really would just want to keep, like, supporting you because I it's, it's so nice to see. I do have, like, a couple questions about things that you even mentioned. Like, a lot of these things seem to be things that maybe you have come up with on your own, but also maybe your board, but also is there a way for anyone who has an idea for that space to come forward with some kind of proposal so that they could present it to you as something that, oh, would WCT be in interested in this to kind of, you know, get behind or, you know, support the development of? Is there is there some kind of process in that way that you offer? Well, I mean, we, we are a member-driven organization, so um, people 
And I guess I should explain that a little bit. Uh, we have um, you know actor members go through an audition process to come on board. Playwrights send a writing sample of their work. We have a reading committee that evaluates um, candidates for membership. And you know once you become a member, then we offer whatever we can to your professional development as an artist. Uh, that being said, people come to us with ideas. I mean, the idea of a comedy night came from the community. The idea for classes came from other people. So there's things that, you know, people pitch to us that we think, yeah, this is feasible. We can certainly do this. We also rent the space out, by the way. If anybody wants a black box locally, we've had we've had video shot there. We've had parties. We've had other theater companies come in uh, and, and do uh, production. So uh, it is available for that as well. That's great. And uh, we welcome, you know, uh, the, the goal is to keep it, keep the lights on uh, and to keep it active for the community to partake of what we offer as, as frequently as possible. We don't, we don't like to have a lot of downtime. So we look for ways to foster that and to, you know, make, make the space usable for, for different functions. So you have like your calendar kind of goes over the full season, like an annual season, right? right? Yes. So that people are aware of, you know, if there's any spaces available or any nights, that's really, that's great. That's great to know. And then also I wanted to, I mean, as an artist, I was always interested in these particular shows that you did. And I want to kind of like give, give a little shout out to it. I remember you started doing this kind of thing and, um, Austin, uh the firehouse when they had the gallery there and right. the spaces for, you know, they would just have like an art gallery. And then there was this collaboration between playwrights and the the art space. And you came up with this idea where, you know, you would have the playwrights be inspired by one of the works of art and then come up with a story. And then you'd have the docent kind of like go through all right. the different art pieces and then stop at one and say, well, you know, describe it shortly, but then launch into the next 10 minute play. How was this e this concept even birthed? Because I always I, I loved the idea of it. I didn't have not seen that anywhere else. Yeah, I, I can't say that we created the concept. I think other groups, theater groups and arts groups have done this before, but you know, we talked about the partnership we had with this arts group um, using their their um, exhibit space above a firehouse in the village. And that kind of fostered this collaboration. So it is what you said, Jen. Uh, it was um, collaborating with the Arts Council mm -hmm. and having uh, a curated, um, docent-led walk through uh, an exhibit. And then when the audience stands in front of a specific artwork, our actors come out and they perform a short play that was inspired by the artwork. And uh, that gives us a chance to, again, incorporate two art forms in one show and give people a chance to enjoy fine art and, and theater at the same time. So it's been very successful. It's very labor intensive and challenging, as you might mm -hmm. imagine. So we don't do it you know, all that often, but when we do it, it's been a success. Um, another type of show that we've done that is similar in nature is called the living music event. And mm -hmm. the difference for that is um, we have a local artist uh, named Ann Carpenter, who's a, a very, very talented vocalist. And she and I kind of sit down and we go over a list of song titles that she feels she could sing. And we come up with like 30 different songs and then we give them to our playwrights and say, write a play if you'd like, inspired by one of these songs. And and we get all these submissions, and then we put together an evening of um, short plays inspired by songs that are, are so the plays are performed, followed by the performance of the song, uh, which inspired it. And that kind of enhances the emotional content of the play. It's just very kind of incredible to see because the play takes you to one level, but then when you hear the song performed, it just takes you to a whole other level, um, emotional level. And it's pretty astonishing. Anyway, we've done this as well. So, we, you know, we try to combine the arts as much as we can, but this is another way, an evening of music and theater together, or an evening of art and theater together. And uh, both have been very popular with our uh, audience. So we'll do them again. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, again, it just speaks to 
what you're doing. You're holding space for the human voice, the human expressiveness of creativity. And I don't know, I, I think that it's so important. It's more important now than ever in this day of AI generative art and everything else, like taking over. And, you know, like I, I must say, one of the... <laughs> One of the uh, plays I recently saw, I think it was one of your main stages, by uh, your playwright Misha. Misha Sinclair. Misha Sinclair, yes. Yes, Misha Sinclair. I loved, and I am so into the AI thing, and there was uh, a great play recently speaking about it, and I think she did a pretty good job because I followed that very closely. And um, th how did how did that like uh sit with the audience were people excited about the results of of that play yeah i mean misha is is very very talented playwright and she works in different genres uh from victorian mysteries to southern gothic to ai work and she seems to be a master of everything she gets yeah. involved in but yeah the audience you know they people responded well to that i mean our our intent was to scare people it was kind of a you know, as, you, as you probably recall, a very kind of horrifying uh, mm -hmm. wrap up to the play, and took people on a really, uh, you know, challenging journey uh, yeah. throughout the course of the play. But um, you know, it, it worked. Uh, yeah. It worked, and that play really had was on a fast track for us. It hadn't gone through as much development as some others that we put on, so we were a little bit uh, concerned about that. But uh, it turned out to be really well. It was performed by a very talented cast. Yeah, um, great, great director, uh, and. Uh, you know, worked really well. So yeah. uh, I, I wish we had the ability to do more than a few of these a year because there's so much talent out there. And, uh, you know, we're limited in this course of the season by by just how much we can do. Right. So um, that was an example, I think, of a of a main stage that worked well and that had a really good um, good audience response. So let me ask you one last question for any, like, musicians who... Um, are interested in perhaps, you know, being under the wing of, you know, Westchester Collaborative Theater uh, nights when you do have this thing. Is there, like, do you just officially find the right people or do people, can people ask you? You know, again, it's the same question, but for, for the musicians, I'm curious because there's so many musicians out there looking to all the time. How yeah. do you like select, it seems like, that's a high selection process. Yeah, well, as I said before, we're not we're not a venue that does music only, right? We do a right. mix, and so music was originally intended just to fill in the blank blank spaces for us, and it's grown. So we have a commitment now to do these concerts every year, but we don't do them every week. Right. So we may do you know twenty or so shows a year, and we've uh, cultivated a list of musicians who have been successful. They're very very talented. Um, they have an audience that looks forward to their return. So we bring them back. So there's limited space for introducing new artists as well, because we like to have the people who have been proven yes. uh, successful come back. But um, we, we asked, to answer your question, people do send us inquiries all the time. Like, we'll be interested in hosting cool. them. And we do entertain that. You know, we'll we'll get some, you know, YouTube video links and take a look at, at their uh, performances. And if it's something that we think... You know, we're we're a, a unique venue in that everything is pretty, um, you know, we, natural sounding. We don't do a lot of amplification. It's all pretty much just natural voice, mm -hmm. natural uh, instrumentation. So some genres like you know, rock doesn't perform well because it would just be blasting in the space that we have. Right. And our audiences are. It's a concert hall environment in terms of music where people are really totally involved in the performance. We don't serve liquor or anything during the performance. So the relationship between the artist and the audience is very unique. And artists love that because they yeah. they can feel the focus uh, during the performance on what they're playing. Yeah. And you know, there's no conversation going on in the audience. So uh, that makes it unique. And whether they come back or not, you uniformly tell us that they love playing uh, WCT. So. Yeah, it seems like they really do. And I again, I think we, we discussed this quickly, but it feels it, for a musician uh, performance, it has that city vibe. Yeah. So, you know, whatever this is that's pulsating through that little black box, it works. And um, 
Yeah, I, I'm thrilled that to see it having grown so much over the years. I think it's really fabulous. Tell us, um, this comedy night that's coming up is November 22nd. Yeah. Um, are tickets still available for that? Yeah, yeah, they are. They're on our website. Okay, so tickets are still available for next week's full fundraiser. Right. The comedy night that's coming up. I know that there's a, a couple other music events that are on the schedule as well. Yeah, Blake Blake Road Trio. Blake is a, a local musician, composer. He'll be performing with his trio on uh, November 16th. And then uh, starting December 6th, our all main stage, our final main stage of the year, which is called Gladys Day. It's a uh, expanded version of a reading uh, that we had earlier in the year. And that'll be running from December 6th through the 15th for two weeks. Nice. Uh, and that'll be our final uh, theater piece for the year. Great. Mm, your main stage is the thing that takes us into the, the next year. Well, listen, Alan, I really, uh, I've always been a supportive fan, you know, but I also know what it takes. And a lot of people don't have that sensibility as you do to like keep this kind of spirit going behind this kind of work and i feel that the community you know is is very appreciative i mean the few times that i've been there recently it just feels like you have that support from a variety of people in the not just the local neighborhood but and beyond one thing that i'm curious about being so close to New York City, does that sometimes, is that sometimes a, like an issue with competition or does it seem to be the thing that is good because people still expect a good performance and a good space, even if they're this far out and sometimes they don't want to go down there. Does it seem to be like an enhancing thing or sometimes too much competition? Like, did, has that ever come up? I mean, not really, because it's, yeah. I think it's a different experience when you go to the city, look, Broadway is risk adverse, right? You see yeah. very few new plays on Broadway anymore. It's it's become you know a home for revivals and you know uh, adoptions of films and whatever whatever it is. It's it's definitely not a home for a lot of new plays. So people who want to see something new, even if it's not mounted, you know, with a million dollar production, this is a place to go to see it. That's that's right. local. And the same thing is true with with music. I mean. If you want to travel down to the city from the suburbs and spend money on parking and, you know, a lot of money on dinner and tickets and stuff and commute, that's an experience. But if you want to stay local for a night and see comparable kinds of music and theater that you could see in the city, then we're an alternative for that. Yeah. And so that's kind of our draw to say to people, you don't have to travel, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to see good music, good art, good theater. You can see it in your community locally and uh, for a fraction of the cost. But, you know, I also want to say that, first of all, it's a community and we're a volunteer driven organization. So we have all these amazingly talented members, but they're also a community of artists who together, believe me, it's not just me at all. I mean, there's so many people who are responsible for maintaining and growing this this company. And again, a lot of it is luck that the right people somehow came together and forged this link. But however it happened, we're, we are a team and we do things together because we have the same goals. And it's been one of the great joys of you know the tenure that I've had is to see how this has grown and and how the people who found the company uh, you know, find a home here and find a community of artists who they grow to love and respect. And for me personally, it's been a total game changer in my life. It's, you know, talk about, talk about finding your bliss. And mm -hmm. I had a long career. I mentioned earlier, all the things I've done in my life, most of which were not all that um, gratifying. I mean, I did things mm -hmm. I did like a lot of people because I had to earn a living and, you know, had to push things to the side that weren't uh, financially remunerative. And, the theater for me has been in this late stage of my career, something that I I look at with uh, honor and respect and, and gratitude. And um, I'm just, you know, so happy to have had the uh, opportunity to work in an environment like this. The ironic thing is, um, since founding the company, I've not had much time to do playwriting on my own. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so the creative impetus that led me to found the company has had to be transferred to other things. And the bliss I get is the production side of it and fostering a playground for other artists and seeing them have an opportunity to get their work done and seeing how much audiences enjoy what we do. Um, that to me is incredibly gratifying and uh, takes the place of having my own work done, which I might get around to uh, one day. And then the other thing, which I'll also just briefly point out, uh, anybody thinking about theater is the business side. It's not all about art. A lot of it is the back end work, um, which has to be done, which which is not enjoyable, but it's part of the price of doing art. Yeah. And um, and it's a handful of us who work on that, but it's just essential, you know, to managing the existence and the growth of an artistic organization like this. You have to be able to put the time in. And, to, and I learned the skills myself. I hadn't taken any courses or anything in arts management. I learned on the job, but uh, it's it's essential to yeah. being able to survive, to get those kind of business skills and to learn how you approach something like this and keep it going. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, you know what? When this is a, the kind of thing that evolves from a labor of love, you know, you you find the way, you know, right. <laughs> which is great because that's when, you know, you can identify the skills needed and, and you just do what you have to do. You know, um, that's the spirit behind it, I think. that, you, And it's true. There's many people, there's many players behind the scenes who make this happen. And it's right. always the case, especially with things like theater. Um, that, you know, you just can't move it forward. It's not a one man show. So it's great that you've managed to, over the years, cultivate these relationships and, you know, make it so that we, you know, you have like a a firm foundation on which you can continue to build. So, yeah, I think it's great. And anybody that is interested in learning more about Westchester Collaborative Theater, please tell us how. Can you tell us your social media handles and also the website that they could find all this information and purchase tickets on anything that they'd be interested in seeing? Yeah, I'm not great on social media, but I do know that we have a uh, Facebook page and Instagram page at uh, Westchester Collaborative Theater. If you click on that, it should take you to our Facebook sites. Our website is um, WC Theater with an ER, WC Theater with an ER.org. And on that website, you'll find only information about the theater, but also um, stuff that's coming up in the weeks and months to come. So it's a repository for that. And we do have links to buying tickets for that. So I would encourage people to go to WCTheater.org. And then if anybody has any curiosity, about startups or the process, uh, I'll give you my email address if they want to email me directly, which is um, A Lutwin, A L U T W I N uh, at W C Theater, again with an E R dot net, N E T. It's A Lutwin at W C Theater dot net. And I'm happy to field any inquiries or really, if anybody is thinking of a startup anywhere in the world that they would like some input and advice about, I'm happy to consult and, and provide some of the experience that I've had. Well, I think that's great because I'm sure that there's people who are interested in doing something like that and they just don't know where to begin. But as you have described your journey, it's possible. The vision is necessary, the commitment, the love, the follow through and, and, and the building of community. I mean, that's what this is about, you know, and that's the beauty of theater. Like, you know, I, I, I'm an artist. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I do theater stuff too, but the art world and the fine art world is so solitary that, you know, that's one of the reasons why I always made sure that theater was somehow a part of, of my, you know, create creative tool chest because it, it lends itself to community and you've really, you know, managed to, to do that in, 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 in a space that has, you know, a need for it. I think Austin is a great location you live in this community as well? I, I, I do. I live I live in Austin as well. I've been here for okay. over 30 years. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean it's you know, another gratifying thing, and I get told this a lot, is um people finding art uh after having left it aside to raise families or to pursue career goals, to come back to something that was a uh pursuit of theirs or a, a joy of theirs when they were young. Mm-hmm. And the game, it's a game changer for them. I mean yeah. 
to have art re-enter your life, whether you're a fine artist or a performing artist, whatever, uh, in middle age, to be re-inspired at a certain point in your life's journey um, is, is amazing. And that's something else our organization can offer to people is that vehicle for exploring your talents, no matter what point of your life you're in. You know, like we two weeks ago, we had a woman playwright. She's 93, 94 years old uh, to a, a reading in the theater. She's a wonderful lady, a former professional ballerina, great career. Uh, but, you know, inspiring to see someone in their 90s wow. still thriving artistically and getting such joy out of seeing their work being staged. That's just wonderful. So that, that's why I say no matter, no matter what age you are, whether you're a student starting out in your career or middle-aged or senior or whatever, there's always a place for you in the arts. And if we can be a home for that and help you find you know, your creative drive and, and, and love of the arts, that's a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. What, what an invitation. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, so much for joining the show. This has just been a very inspiring conversation. I thank you for coming. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Not As Crazy As You Think. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And remember, mental health is attainable for anyone, especially those labeled with mental illness. Until next time, peace out.